Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Social Europe Talk, recorded in the European Parliament in Brussels. Today our topic is inequality in Europe and what can be done about it. As always, I'm joined by a panel of experts and politicians. Today, uh, in particular, by Lorenzo Antonucci from Teesside University, Michael Dauderstedt, formerly of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in Germany, and now a consultant in the area of inequality. And to my left, the MEP from Barcelona, Javi Lopez, who is also the rapporteur for report on inequality in the European Parliament. And later on, we're going to be joined by uh, the vice president of the S&D Group, Udo Bullmann. So, Lorenza, let me start with you. Okay. Uh, you do research on social policy. Um, what do you think are the most pressing issues in, when it comes to inequality in Europe? I th yes, I think that uh, what's happening right now in Europe um, is what I call a reconfiguration of the welfare mixes. And for that I mean that people have less state resources to start with because of a uh, process of austerity which affected a different welfare states. Uh, they also get less resources from the labor market because of uh, increasing precarity in the labor market, uh, which means that finally they, they get more resources from the family, which is becoming the last resort of welfare support. And this is a process which uh, creates uh, inequality because fundamentally it's a transmission of inequality across families. It's a process that I uh, analyze in my research on young people, uh, but it's uh, happening uh, across the spectrum also for other sectors of, of the society. Another thing that uh, I've analyzed in my research is how, how this is affecting the political sphere. So we have done research on the relationship between inequality and, uh, uh, and Brexit, and we found that actually what's happening is that um, there's a declining level of support for traditional politics due to the fact that people uh, feel more insecure and also that they have less economic resources. This is not affecting just uh, marginalized parts of the population, so the working class, but it's affecting also intermediate groups, so the so-called squeeze middle. So what's happening is that there's this intermediate group which uh, represents the ordinary people, which is slowly declining to the bottom uh, due to uh, increasing level of risk and having less resources, as I said before, because of, of the uh, reconfiguration of the welfare mixes. And in terms uh, of inequality in Europe, um, one last thing that I would add is that uh, there is a process of um, restructuring of uh, national policies which is triggered by European uh, EU initiatives um, such as the role that the European semester played uh, since 2008, an increasing level of uh, influence that the European semester has on the welfare state, national welfare states. And unfortunately, this process, which potentially could be good to reform uh, the EU in the direction of decreasing inequality, well, unfortunately, this process has been very much in the direction of uh, reinforcing inequality because lots of reforms that have been implemented towards the semester were uh, led by parts of the Commission, like the JECFIN, which uh, didn't believe that inequality was a problem as such. And even recently, uh, with the creation of the pillar the, of uh, social rights, I think there's uh, um, there is an understanding of uh, the social field which is separated from the economic field. So I think this separate, artificial separation between the economic and the social makes really hard for us to tackle inequality. So one of the priority, I, I would say, in terms of the politics of the inequality would be to uh, try to modify a bit the smash, try to add more elements that tend to uh, decrease inequality. You mentioned an interesting point uh, by saying that there is a relationship between the Brexit vote and uh, inequality. Do you think this is isolated for Brexit or is there a general relationship between populism um, and inequality? What do you think? Uh, well, from the research we're doing, it's still in process because we're lucky that we are now having the really uh, long term of elections across Europe. So we will be able to say uh, something more about it, I think, in the next few months. But what we are already um, funding with our research is that it's uh, this declining, well, this decline of traditional politics is general in Europe, as we know, and these are common patterns. So in Brexit, it got obviously, um, it got represented in a very direct way because it was a referendum, uh, but we can see the manifestation of this in the, the forthcoming and the past, uh, you know, election rounds, like, uh, the, you know, in the, in the Dutch elections, in a in the French elections, you see that traditional parties 
uh, do not uh, perform well. So there is a really an increasing dissatisfaction with traditional politics with both the centre-right and the centre-left. And this is due to uh, people uh, increasing level of uh, dissatisfaction with the economy and feeling that they have lost since especially 2008. So you can see really uh, that if you ask um, people, uh, do you think that your personal position has worsened uh, in the last five years, they would say yes. And therefore, this is reflected also in, the, in the, how they go to vote. Okay, so I haven't done the full research yet, but the hypothesis is there might well be the case that there is a relationship between populism and, and we, we Yes, we are obviously in the process of analyzing that, yeah. Okay, uh, Michael, uh, may I come to you? You've done a lot of uh, empirical research on, on inequality, and if somebody asks you what are the sort of three to four most pressing inequality-related issues in Europe, what would you say? Well, <clears throat> if you talk about inequality in Europe, um, we have to differentiate between different dimensions. Uh, there's one, uh, the inequality within countries. Uh, that's mostly what you were talking about, which is affected by European policies to some extent. Uh, and then the inequality between countries, between member states, uh, which is also affected by European policies. Actually, the European treaties foresee uh, as a goal of European integration that uh, the income levels should converge to some extent. There is a lot of talk about cohesion and convergence, uh, perhaps more on the regional level than on the country level, but it's uh, still it's, it's clear in the treaties and in other EU documents. Um, how did these things develop? Well, inequality within countries has increased in many countries over the last decades, one has to say. Uh, actually, the process is a little bit decelerating. Uh, it uh, depends on the country. Uh, for instance, Germany was a, is a country which has been experienced a strong increase in inequality in the early 2000s, uh, between 2000 and, and 2010 or so, and now it's a little bit more stabilizing. Other countries uh, are much more worrying. Uh, in the absolute levels of inequality on a national level are quite different. Uh, for instance, the Czech Republic uh, is a, a rather egalitarian country. Uh, the, one of the most unequal countries is Spain. Uh, um, now, inequality between countries, uh, there we have a, a relatively good record by the European integration over the last 20 years or so. Uh, actually, uh, since uh, preparing and joining uh, the EU, uh, preparing for entry and joining the EU, the uh, new member states of Central Eastern Europe have experienced a relatively strong growth. Their growth rates were much higher than the growth rates of the traditional Western, Northwestern core of, of Europe, like Scandinavia, UK, Germany, and so on. Uh, and that has led to a kind of convergence of income. Uh, the problem is that uh, this strong growth of uh, the poor economies has only partially compensated uh, the increase of inequality within countries. So if you try to calculate an EU-wide inequality indicator, that what I did, um, you have uh, of the picture that inequality has declined until about the crisis 2008, then uh, a little bit increased and is now, since about four or five years, uh, relatively stable. If you use as an indicator the so-called S80, S20 ratio, which is the relationship between the income of the richest 20% to the poorest 20%. Uh, that is on the EU level uh, about six uh, at uh, purchasing power parities and nine at uh, exchange rates. Uh, uh, at purchasing power parities, the inequality is usually lower because the purchasing power of income in poor countries is higher. Uh, this development is well, it's, it's not good use because uh, 
in former times we had a decline of inequality, but it's not so bad because it's at least stable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, one has to see that uh, this stability of the relative inequality hides an increase of absolute inequality in the terms of differences of income. So if we compare average income of the poorest countries or the poorest uh, parts of a country uh, with the richest ones, uh, or if we compare wages in Romania with wages in, 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 in Luxembourg, or if we compare minimum wages in Romania with minimum wages in Luxembourg, we get terrible disparities. It's a, a ratio of 1 to 50 or something like that, which is, of course, uh, a reason for people to migrate from poor countries to rich countries and then we come again to the questions of populism. I think when we are talking about Brexit, uh, the issue of migration from Eastern Europe into the UK was one of the uh, well, salient issues in, in the campaign and uh, I think also that the loss of jobs through relocation of production from high-wage countries to low-wage countries uh, has also been uh, uh, an issue, the kind of deindustrialization, the, 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 the decline of the traditional blue-collar working class in, in high-wage countries. All this is uh, part of the complex which uh, leads to the rise of populism. Mm -hmm. Uh, Javi, may I come to you? Uh, we've now heard a lot of arguments from our researchers, uh, you know, what, what they found in their inquiries. Coming to you as a, as a policymaker, um, what can you do about it? Well, we should do, about, um, we should do more and better, no? especially we have to rethink our welfare state because our welfare state it was like the, the model, the way to reduce inequalities that we built in uh, Europe uh, the 20th century. Uh, but coming back to uh, some uh, questions, I would like to say, well, first of all, we learned in the last years that uh, inequalities is not a problem only about social affairs. It's a problem with the, inst the institutional stability. And this uh, talks about uh, extremism and populism, uh, especially these, these new movements that we, we have. And also we learned that we have a economic problem with uh, inequalities. Our potential growth could be damaged by these high, uh, high inequalities that we, we, we feel in Europe. No? Uh, and the EU has to, to rethink their goals in this, in this uh, field. Because we had in the last uh, years, in our socioeconomic roadmaps, like the um, 2020 agenda, like Lisbon, uh, well, we try to fight against poverty. We have in the treaties the convergence. I know the fight against poverty and convergence, they are linked with uh, uh, fight against inequality, but it's not the same. It's not exactly the same. And then the European Parliament has the, the opportunity to put on the agenda the fight, the, the fight against inequality as a goal of the European Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, Udo has just joined us. Uh Welcome, okay. and <laughs> no problem, and may I ask the, uh, the next question to you. What do you think are the, the most important political initiatives that are necessary in order to tackle the uh, inequality issue that we face in Europe, or the, the many dimensions of the inequality issue we face in Europe? I, first of all, would like to underline that, and this was already Javier's uh, point, point, we have to be fully aware and publicly admit that inequality is not only a feature of how we could describe our uh, society sociologically, but this is a poison to the development of our value-based society. This has to be a part of our awareness, political awareness, so that we organize um, a sense of readiness for change. I think political will is the main obstacle, political will is the main hurdle of uh, not improving the situation. And once that is done, we can talk strategies, we can talk uh, certain measures, we can talk initiatives. Um, we have a whole lot of good papers of how to improve, 
uh, on paper I can describe, the Commission can describe, everybody can describe what is to be done. Uh, look at, for instance, the so-called Lisbon strategy. We, at the beginning of uh, the century already, uh, described what to be done against child poverty, uh, young pe people uh, uh, leaving uh, schools too early, etc., etc. So on paper we are fine, but the implementation of our policy programs, that is lacking. And here I can tell you that in our everyday work in the European Parliament, we find a huge difference in the treatment of different policy areas when it comes to fiscal uh, uh, rules, when it comes to uh, <coughs> restrictive uh, uh, fiscal obligations on national budgets. Here we are totally tough. Whereas when it comes to the fight against uh, youth unemployment, when it comes to the fight uh, against uh, poverty in our societies, we are more or less relaxed and we are uh, having a lot of talk, cheap talk. This is my main problem. And what exactly, very easy question, what exactly do you think needs to change so we can move from writing the papers to implementing the papers? Well, it's very easy. Um, we have, for instance, I tell you, on the basis of the given fiscal rules. We have a stability and growth pact which is stupid enough and cannot distinguish between a national player uh, which for instance after a national election gives thousands of jobs uh, in its uh, top positions of, of state corporations to family members and a state actor which effectively fights youth unemployment. And my proposal would be, for instance, to say we have to distinguish on public expenses whether they are qualified public expenses or whether they are not qualified public expenses and encourage member states to do something useful with the taxpayers' monies. Those countries who mod which modernize, those countries who invest themselves in the fight against poverty, in the fight against unemployment, they have to be honored and they deserve support. Whereas countries who invest in their past, bureaucratic past, I would not dare uh, to support this kind of strategy. But we have to modernize our schemes of intervention to make them more intelligent, more modern and more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And Lorenzo, if I can come back to you. Um, Michael already mentioned that there are many dimensions of, of, of inequality, not just uh, within states and between states, but also in completely different life areas. Um, especially if you look at potential generational conflicts between the interests of young people and older people, and as well as a topic that we discussed this morning already, health inequalities. And because you have the shocking circumstances that within a very narrow um, space, you actually have very, very different life expectancies. So, you know, when you come to these kind of elements, what, 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 what kind of policies would you like to see to address these? One of the things we discussed this morning is that uh, the European Commission White Paper, paper, for example, mentions inequality only in relation to intergenerational inequality. They, they don't accept or uh, acknowledge the existence of intergenerational inequality, which uh, I, th I think is a problem, especially for young people. So this idea that young people are not all the same, uh, the rising level of unemployment and precarity is actually reinforcing intergenerational inequalities because young people are using and mobilizing more family support in order to go through uh, precarious uh, labor market uh, transitions. And therefore, the, very simply, the young people which come from uh, wealthy families would have it better, would have you know, smoother transition through labor market. And I think what um, sort of the neoliberal discourse, I wouldn't even call neoliberal, but the, uh, the common discourse when addressing these issues is thinking that we need to cut the welfare state to address the, general, the generational imbalances, where actually it's the opposite. It's the, um, is the fact that the welfare state is being privatized so much in the last 20, 30 years, which makes this generation of young people suffering from the lack of, of state support. So I think uh, uh, intergenerational inequality and the challenges that are facing young people should, be, should go together. So first of all, we should really talk about intergenerational inequality 
uh, as, a, as a manifestation of spreading level inequalities between people which have different resources. So you can call it class inequalities, so you can just address it as wealth, uh, you know, differences in wealth, resources and income resources. Uh, and the other thing uh, I think we should do, and in relation also um, to what you just said, is, um, is the European semester, working in what I mentioned before in the European semester, because in terms of implementation, that's a really powerful tool to implement reforms. Uh, not a tool which is at the end of the European Parliament at the moment, but and that's a part of the problem, so there should be a discussion on why the European semester, so which is implemented the Growth Stability Pact, is given to the end of the executive, just the executive. So no, there is no actually feedback from uh, the, the electorate, from, this, from the citizens. Uh, and, and it's actually, it's the most powerful instrument. It's the, it's the instrument which is having most effect on uh, citizens' lives because the reforms that are implemented through the European semester are, um, are, are, are very carefully checked by the Commission. There are missions in the member states and they've been very profound, especially in Southern European countries. So we know that the EU can actually change policies now. So since 2008, paradoxically, the EU has become way more powerful in changing policies. The problem is that they're changing policies in a direction, um, the economic direction, uh, not taking into account the link between the economic policies and this rising level of inequality we're talking about. So I think one direction should be integrating uh, the economic policies with the social policies. The, the new initiative of the European Social Pillar and the Social Scorecard create almost like an add-on to a procedure which is really strong on the economic. We need more than that. We need to change the way we talk about economic policies uh, in the Commission. And part of that, I think it's asking for other DGs to enter into the debate, to the Parliament to enter into the debate, and also for the Commission to be more in touch with the discourse that is going on in academia, because there are many proposals and many uh, different ways of looking at inequality. And it seems to me when I read the Commission papers that they're a bit stuck in what the debate was uh, uh, before the crisis. Mm -hmm. I mean, Michael, uh, Lorenza seems to advocate a more integrated and comprehensive approach to, uh, to inequality. And are issues such as health inequality maybe only a function of underlying issues that, you know, the root causes somewhere else? Or what, what kind of integrated strategy would you propose in order to tackle this? Well, I think health inequality is probably very much correlated with income inequality. Uh, in Germany, you can see that very clearly that uh, peop richer people have a higher life expectancy than poorer people. Privately insured people uh, are better treated uh, and quicker treated uh, than, than people who have just the usual legal uh, health insurance. Um, but uh, I think in the end, from my point of view, uh, we should really focus on income inequality and of course we can do a lot uh, improving welfare systems uh, like health, like education for instance, uh, because actually access to public goods and services is part of the income which is usually not calculated uh, within the statistics but it, it could be and possibly should be and it would show that Actually, it would improve income. It would reduce income inequality. It would improve the distributional figures because it's like the difference between market income inequality and disposable income inequality. When you take into account taxes and transfers, inequality gets lower. And if you take into account access to public goods and services, again, it gets gets lower. But often. Uh, our welfare systems are not really focused on reducing income inequality. They are more oriented towards maintaining a certain income status, like the German pension system, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the most uh, the, 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 the most pressing issues or most promising uh, policies are tax policies. Yeah. I think uh, wealth tax, inheritance tax. Uh, top tax rates for high incomes, all these things uh, we should to some extent 
go back to the levels we, these taxes had in the uh, 50s, 60s and 70s. Uh, if you look at the US, it's a, still at the time of Ronald Reagan, uh, income taxes were much, much higher than today. And uh, th these were times when economic growth was not bad at all. Uh, so it, it, one cannot say that high taxes prevent uh, good economic growth. Mm? Uh, that is, uh, I think, one thing. The other thing is, of course, the labor market. Uh, it's good that Germany introduced finally uh, a minimum wage. And I think these kind of minimum wages we should have uh, within Europe, uh, of course not a, a single U uh, uh, European minimum wage because the purchasing power parities are different, the productivity levels are different, but a minimum wage a which is uh, a, a kind of common floor or let's say a minimum wage which is linked to the GDP per capita. Uh, let's say it should be about 50% of the average wage or something like that. Uh, and because there are huge differences between European countries in this regard. And I think this kind of regulation, which uh, takes care that wages increase with GDP, that uh, the, with, with productivity, that is a, an important thing. Uh, and and uh, again, there, uh, there have been countries, especially I have to say Germany, which where wages for a long time uh, have uh, increased much less in productivity. Uh, the wage share has declined, uh, real wages have stagnated, and uh, that has led or was part of the uh, phenomenon that Germany runs an ex enormous export surplus because people are not consuming so much as they possibly would if they had higher wages. And let me come again to our policymakers. I mean, uh, I'd like to pick up your idea of a sort of broader view and integrated strategy against, um, uh, against inequality. What in political terms can be done? I mean, how can, for instance, Lorenzo's idea of broadening the remit of the European semester and sort of strengthening the, the social element and social um, analysis part of it? Uh, you know, what, what can actually be done on the European level to sort of change the mechanics so that this broader view can be can be implemented? Well, I think we could do two things, two different things. For um, On one hand, we can build a real uh, social policy in the EU. Like, we are talking about the European social pillar. This is a nice idea, but uh, it's a list of uh, recommendations, basically. Uh, we will have some rules, but if we will want a real social pillar, that it's a, a real common floor, uh, social floor, uh, for salaries, but not only for salaries, uh, even for services or rights in the labor market, we need uh, rules, rules, uh, second institutions like policies, programs, third uh, resources. This is the three elements that we should have in a real, like, um, social policy in the EU, uh, a real European uh, social pillar. But on the other hand, this is not enough. This is clearly not enough. Because, because if we don't link the social uh, dimension to the semester, it was really well explained that the semester is like a really hardcore machine uh, with really capability to enforce the member states uh, to have really mandatory uh, lines in uh, our budgets and in our reforms, national budgets and national reforms, we will fail, as, as we see with the recommendations of the Lisbon Agenda or the 2020 Objectives Against Poverty. And then we have a macroeconomic, macroeconomic imbalance uh, procedure. This is really hardcore uh, like uh, procedure. And we have a scoreboard with deficits and so on, with uh, macroeconomic lines. We should put uh, no, at the same level and coordinate our socioeconomic goals Inequality should be one of these, but not only, you know, like our poverty, we talk about unemployment or like, this is a real imbalance, you no? Know? Uh, it's true that we, we should like, and be capable to, to, to stabilize our national budgets, you no? Know? And this is a real uh, imbalance, you no? Know, to have uh, uh, an, a too much deficit, but it's at the same time to have 25% of unemployment that we had in Spain three years ago, four years ago. Um, and then coordinate our social uh, objectives with our um, macroeconomic objectives that should be, and uh, uh, it was said also, uh, should be 
uh, less aggressive in terms of fiscal consolidation that we saw in the period 2010 to 2015. We are changing this, I think, like, uh, he is one of the protagonists that are pushing to this change. Um, but this is the, the point to, to do, these two sides. And at the same time, we should do, don't forget that the social welfare state is basically in our national member states. And we could do a lot in our national member states because we thought our like national welfare states with um, the beverage report you know, after uh, with the first labor um, government in the United uh, Kingdom after uh, the Second World War, like pensions, um, transfers, uh, healthcare, uh, education. This is, and this was, was more or less the program uh, for 75 years, 40 years for the, for the left wing, for the socialist parties. But the point is, with these huge inequalities, this is not enough. This is not enough. And probably we need new tools. Uh, probably we have to think in the new social risks that we have, because we have, like, the society is different. We have monoparental families. We have, like, another world <laughs> after these 75 years, another economy, the globalization, no? uh, Rebuild to have a more effective uh, redistribution and more fair distribution and like to have impact in the distribution because this is one of the main problems that we have. We have these uh, inequalities because the, in the distribution is so, so, so unequal. Mm -hmm. And Udo, the same question goes to you. What could be the elements of, a, of an integrated strategy that links the European level with the national level and can have some oomph? I think uh, Lorenza is completely right when she argues for a holistic approach, a holistic policy approach, and for a multi-level strategy, including uh, various actors from the European level uh, yeah, till the regions, not only the member states, but also the regional level. S a small example, year 2002, Spring Summit in Barcelona. Heads of state and government decided that each and any young man or woman leaving school should be offered a decent job or a relevant trainee scheme after three months. It was the second time that we decided on that. The first time was 1996 uh, when the employment strategy was founded in Luxembourg and the Luxembourg presidency. I have no clue how often we decided on the same plan again without doing it. So we are in an area of what experts call soft law procedure, where your sharpest instrument is the peer review. Unlike the Stability and Growth Pact, where you have concrete sanctions, uh, you are in the middle of nowhere. So you have the peer review, you have the new declamation, you have the, the proposal by the Commission, and what is going to happen if you do not fulfill the criteria? Nothing. What we have to alter is that we more and more develop towards binding rules. Binding rules as you have it in the fiscal policy area as well. Binding rules on the development of environmental goals, uh, sustainability, social goals, positive economic goals when it comes to creating jobs and fair employment and decent employment. How can that be done? We have to change the semester procedure to become a more serious exercise. We need, if you ask me, sanctions and incentives, and we need parliamentary scrutiny. Only if there is a concrete control by parliamentarians, and parliamentarians are more than today, we have a certain say in the discussion. We do reports, we have a certain procedure of accepting guidelines and recommendations, but we have to be part of the game, otherwise we will not come into a constellation where we indeed seriously follow up to what was the recommendation of the, of the Commission. So maybe then the country-specific recommendation might look quite different in the future. I have yet to, seen, uh, yet to see one that says increase the minimum wage or something like that. But I'm afraid this is all we have time for today. Thank you very much for joining us and I hope we, uh, we can continue the discussion. Obviously, there were lots of topics that we did not get the chance to discuss, like the digital revolution and so on and so forth. But I'm sure we'll do that at future episodes um, of Social Europe Talk. Thank you very much and see you later.